Hey there, Nerd Clan. This episode of the Potterverse is brought to you by MinuteWithMary.com, where I have got all of your beauty needs covered from makeup to skincare and tools. And one of the most important things that I recommend is that you join my complimentary, completely free Facebook group. I share lots of tips and tricks in there that you can use with the makeup that you already have, or maybe it'll inspire you to try something different. In Facebook, search the hashtag MinuteWithMary and request to join my marvelous VIP group. So once again, the hashtag Minute with Mary. Request to join my marvelous VIPs. I'll let you on in there. No purchase necessary. Hopefully it'll inspire you to try something a little different. And if you're in the market for something different, you can head on over to Minute Mary, MinuteWithMary.com to check things out there. <laughs> From Providence, Rhode Island, welcome to the Potterverse. It's a podcast dedicated to the book and film universe of Harry Potter. So grab your favorite wands and time turners and let's step into the night and pursue that flighty temptress adventure. My name is Mary Larson, and I'm a Gryffindor. My name is Blake, and I am a proud Slytherin. And sure I do, are. I do want to say this: I'm so glad that we do these episodes live. Do you want to know why? I would. Because we get all the comments from everybody as we're doing this live on Facebook and YouTube and Twitter and Instagram. Everybody's watching us as we're doing this. And of course, everybody that knows that is watching this uh, live knows that this is a fly in the wall experience. But this episode, this episode is a special one because mm-hmm. it is listener driven and we we have some thoughts that we're going to share yeah. and we have some things that are going on but I I, I want to start this this episode off just right with the okay. first comment that I got okay uh, one well the first one that I want to call out on the podcast Bring for it the on. podcast listeners as we're as we're recording this live Ellen Hanwright on Facebook says that uh, she's from Australia and a proud Hufflepuff so suck it Blake lol <laughs> <laughs> well done, Ellen. All the puffs are giving you lots of virtual high fives. That's why I'm out. Oh, out my goodness. on you Hufflepuffs. Oh, no. You're all so sensitive. I'm Hufflepuff at heart. You are a Hufflepuff at heart. Like, I wish I was in my next life that I could be a Hufflepuff. You know, the funny thing is I probably would have pegged you for a Ravenclaw. Really? Yeah. Yeah, I would have. Uh, just because you're, you're like super smart and, you know. You, I'm you, just that. No. You are. You're wicked smart. And, but... But I know now, after being married to you for 10 years and being together for 13, uh, that you are definitely a Hufflepuff at heart. You, you're just... I'm a Gryffindor. Yeah, you're, oh, yeah. You know, you're, you're like, a total grip. Like, there's no question about but it. But I lean to the puff side. Yeah. You're, you're like... <laughs> <laughs> Most of my friends, if not all of my friends, aside from my husband, are Hufflepuffs. I've got a couple of Gryffindors sprinkled in. Yes. And a couple of Ravenclaws. And you're married to a Slytherin. And a couple of my best friends are Slytherins. So, Man. You're welcome. I just got them all. I just got all the Hogwarts in my in my life. All right, so um, we of course are talking about Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. But before we delve into this final episode about this amazing book, we wanted to remind you, of course, that you can check out all of our other podcasts and blogs by heading on over to maryandblake.com. As Blake and I mentioned, one of the podcasts that we really recommend during 2020 is for you to rewatch or watch for the first time This Is Us. It's really a wonderful television show, and Blake and I have had it a podcast about every single episode. So if you're looking to fill your evenings or your days or your drives with another podcast of ours, trust us, we have a lot to keep you company. <laughs> you can head on over to maryandblake.com, and if we bring you joy, if this podcast makes you smile, if you like what we do, if you like coming on here live and being a part of the community, know that it does cost us money to keep this all going, and we would highly, highly recommend that you go to join the nerd clan.com for as little as two dollars a month you can support all of this and it's kind of like pbs it's it's listener supported so <laughs> um it's really important for us to make sure that we let people know about that there are wonderful perks to being a join the nerd clan.com it's also known as outlandercastclan.com oh, if you yeah. remember there as well thank you all so much and a huge thank you to all of our patrons who already contribute thank you from the bottom of our hearts you truly keep this going are right, you ready to get into the show i Bobbin? am all right, i let's, am let's do it i saw I swear that I'm up to no good.
All right, so we got a quick question of the day. Okay. Quick question of the day yeah. to start this off. I mean, okay. Since we're not doing our normal thing that we no- we do in our previous in our previous podcast. episodes, I'm going to start yes. this with a quick question. Marvin, where do you rank this book, The Sorcerer's Stone? Or um, The Philosopher's Stone. A.K.A. Because mine is The Philosopher's Stone. <laughs> uh, where do you rank this book among the group of seven books? You know, it's hard for me to determine that right now. I would love to revisit this question later on, Uh possibly even after rereading each book, because this might be one of the deepest dives that I've done into the Philosopher's Stone. I've, of course, read it a million times, Mm -hmm. um, but I really enjoyed this because this established the world for us. So it's definitely in my top three. Huh, that's interesting. That is interesting. I know that there's a lot of simplicity to it. There's a lot of things that move quickly or things that may seem pointless. But this right here opened the door to a magical world for me. So for that, it needs to be in my top three. Sure, sure. Well, I will pose the question to you, uh, the listeners that are live right now. And if you're on the podcast app, don't feel left out. Please don't. Send us your emails at maryandblakemedia at gmail.com and let us know. Uh, Or, um, you know, just join us live next time and you get your uh, your your whole deal uh, read by us, partic- mm-hmm. uh, you know. As a matter of fact, if it happens to stand out, hey, there you go. Uh, so my answer for this, um, the Sorcerer's Stone, I would probably put uh, fourth. Okay, fourth. So um, you actually know your rankings. I, as I said, I this is something that I definitely want to revisit as we continue to delve into these books because I'm just savoring it more than I ever have by slowing down and doing two chapters a week. Mm-hmm. I'm just like, I'm just loving everything. Yep, it's like a gobstopper. <laughs> <laughs> I'm loving every layer, even more so. <laughs> this one's turkey dinner. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a lot of people there chiming in. Ellen says the Goblet of Fire is the second. Uh, An- another Ellen. Okay. Oh, Ellen yeah, says this Phoenix one is, is the third. Jeez, uh, uh, Hillary says it's fourth. Uh, you know, we got a whole we got a whole bunch of people uh, mm-hmm. saying coming in here and saying what this one is ranked at. Uh, everyone's saying fourth. Uh, Asineth says fourth. So it's. Probably in that range, it's I think. It's in the upper half for most people. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I definitely, definitely know that uh, Goblet of Fire is probably going to be my least favorite. You haven't even read it. I know. And you want to know why I know? That why? It's gonna be? Because it's just so bloated. I just know off the top. I know right off the jump. It's not, it's not going to we'll be. We'll see. It's going to be my least favorite. We'll see. It's probably going to be a neck and neck race between Chamber of Secrets and Goblet of Fire. Chamber of Secrets is actually a phenomenal book that you've also never read. That's, that's, so, that's true. I just, let's see. You know, it's, it's, you know what it is? I think the movie <laughs> colors my interpretation of the book probably. I wasn't a huge fan of the film. Of Goblet of Fire? Uh, no, of Chamber of Secrets. And Goblet of Fire. Gilderoy Lockhart? I oh, I do love Kenneth Branagh. He you literally every time we watch every time Chamber you watch, of Secrets, you're like time. you laugh. Every you time. laugh at all of his lines. Every I don't time. think I ever see you laugh nope. in Harry Potter movies. Nope, not, not like a Gilderoy Lockhart. Chamber... <laughs> <laughs> okay, he so is, he is great. Kenneth Branagh is the perfect choice. Continuing, <laughs> for, he, he for truly, him. truly was. All right, so I uh, all right. So now that's the quick that's a quick question of the day. How are we going to rate this? Because normally in our podcasts, we have a rating system. And yes. for Outland, it's kilts. For This Is Us, it's lemonades. Yes. Uh, for Game of Thrones, I, uh, geez, what was it? I don't remember. I can't remember. Oh, dragons. It was oh, dragons. Yes. Uh, for um, for The Leftovers, it was Damon's. <laughs> for uh, Damon Lindelof, yes. Uh, we get, uh, oh, for The Crown, it's Corgi's. Mm, yes. I have a couple of ideas on how okay. we should rank these. All right. Should rank it. The ranking system could be maybe perhaps uh, wands. Okay. Uh, snitches. Ooh. My personal favorite. Yes. Is lightning bolts. Okay. I, I, I'm kind of in on the lightning bolt game. Me too. Uh, but I will leave it up to the listeners. Okay. And uh, people. The are, live listeners. Yes. Uh, everyone is up. Everyone's saying lightning. Oh, we saw one with wands. <laughs> we saw one wands. One broom. But uh, some people, he, uh, we got three responses saying lightning Ooh, bolts. Oh, Tamaris is Hedwig's. <sighs> Tamara knows the way to my heart. Um, Butterbeers. Ooh, cheers. Mm, okay. How about Harry's? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I think- We're getting a okay, lot of lightning we're bolts. We're getting a lot of lightning yes. bolts. Okay, so we'll do lightning bolts. Um, 
And because there's an emoji. Thank you, Melissa. I'm in. Done. Thank you, Melissa. Perfect. <laughs> that is it. All right. So how many lightning bolts are you giving the Philosopher's Stone? Everyone who's in live, please join in. You can also use point systems, but draw those lightning emojis to show us how many on a scale of one to five, one being the worst, burr, and five being the best. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. I Whenever I say the worst, I have to say burr. Oh, always. Right? Always. <laughs> and many people don't get it. Here comes the general to Washington. That's because it's from Hamilton. All I want is for my kids to say that too. <laughs> you are the worst. Buh. Um, all right. So my rating on Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. Oh, uh, man. <laughs> Come, while Listen, we're young, man. Marvin. While we're young. I'm going to give it a 4.8 lightning bolts. I really, 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 really love this book. There's just a few things that... You know, as I said, it, it was it was the first book. And I think as you go on to read the future books in the series, you come back and you say, this was the first book. And it was aimed at 11-year-olds. So as a 38-year-old reading it right now, yeah. you know, we can delve into different things. But you know what? I'm giving it a 4.9. I'm bumping it up. Whoa. 4.9. Holy smokes. Yeah, Coming there. out of the gate hot. I went there. 4.9. Wow, man. All right. Uh, for me, I'm giving this one four and a half lightning bolts. I really enjoyed this book. It was quick. It was easy. Uh, it was. It, it clearly was well thought out. I, though I think that there are some logical things that the author runs into as the series goes on that she has to kind of retcon um, in Ooh, later books. Rachel Dido says she's giving it four and three quarters. Oh, so cute. Look at you. <laughs> Look at, you know what? No, I'm going to play it for you, Rachel. No! Um... Yeah, I'm giving it four and a half because I think that there are some things that she does have to retcon later on. Uh, there's perfect use of symmetry, uh, great bookends, and as anybody knows, bookends that listens, are the way to Blake's heart. The, the bookends are the way to my heart. It is one of the <laughs> commandments of Mary and Blake Media. You always use a good bookend when you can do it, uh, and the audacity behind the world building. Mm. Uh, it, it's it's like it's. It, it it's truly is audacious. It Correct. is it is worthy of our awe, uh, and I love that. I love that portion. Agreed. So, what are your GBGs? The good, the bad, and the great. Now, remember, friends who are joining us live, to put your GBGs in the comments below. Um, I always do a GBG unless something is a five plus, uh, meaning that it's better than the best. Then it's a so GGB. I'm going to do my GBGs. Yes. And frequently the way that I do my GBGs are different than Blake's. Blake likes to analyze things a bit more differently than I do, whereas sure. I like to talk about how things make me feel. And that's why the podcast rules. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. So my good is Harry's birthday. Harry's birthday from the moment he blows out those candles and Hagrid knocks down the door and tells to him, you're a wizard, Harry, opens up the entire world of the wizarding world, takes him shopping on Diagon Alley. We get to hear, see, and smell all things Diagon Alley. He gets Hedwig as his present. I mean, Hagrid already starts to feed him. We've already talked about Hagrid is such an amazing gift giver. I have gushed about my love for Hagrid and for Hedwig. So the fact that both of those things come to be on Harry's birthday, sold. That's mm -hmm. my good. If my birthday could ever be like Harry's birthday, I'd die a happy woman. I mean, I feel like I'd really die a happy woman, but I would. Um, my bad is knowing how terribly abused, emotionally abused, and physically abused Harry was by the Dursleys, who are his family. Mm. Harry, of course, was orphaned at the age of one. Okay, his parents were tragically murdered by the worst villain of all time. And then his family takes him in because they have to. And rather than treat him even like a human, like a decent person would do, they treat him terribly. I mean, they just belittle him left and right. They keep him in a cupboard under the stairs. Um, Dudley is allowed to physically beat up his cousin. They just speak so poorly about him. So, um, And the other thing that bothers me about this is not only how the Dursleys treat him, but how the Wizarding World, a.k.a. Dumbledore, mm -hmm. left him to hang as well. Mm -hmm. So in my mind, I'm just going to live in the fan fiction that I read in the beginning of rereading this book where McGonagall adopted Harry from a young age and he can have a nice childhood. Am I great? Of course. Where and this is this might feel like a little bit of a cop out. 
but the people, places, and smells of the Wizarding World. And let's not forget the food. Like, let's not forget the food, oh, please. Yeah, Pumpkin on. pasties, butter beer, chocolate frogs, birdie butts, every flavor of beans. You think about how many cookbook recipes have come out of this, how many YouTube <laughs> channels about cooking about the Harry Potter food. Yeah. You go to the Wizarding World of Harry Potter, and there's literally like all the sights and smells that were described in this book, but also the food. I mean, there is so much food in this book. Yeah, it's like every other page. Yeah, and I dig it. I dig it because it makes me want to be creative. There's, but one, I... kid, there's one kid on YouTube that we were watching. Yeah. He, he makes li- literally every single food yes. item that's listed in the pages of this book. Yes. In, in all of Harry Potter. Starting even with, like, I think in the first chapter, um, Dudley is throwing cereal across the room and he makes like a magical cereal. Yeah, like like out of, <laughs> he makes like a bowl out of cereal yeah. and puts cereal in the cereal bowl, milk, and then eats the whole thing. It's unbelievable. It's like stupid how so awesome it is. I am just in awe of how all of the senses are encapsulated in this book. And that's my great. Uh, Rebecca on Facebook says, uh, the GBG, she's got a great, which is a tie, the first chapter and all the stuff, the last chapter mm. with Coral, how that yes. all kind of interrelates. Uh, yes. I kind of like that. Yeah, again, symmetry and bookends. Yes. <laughs> again, you know when you have a good bookend, you know that you've been put in the right place. You've been ta- well taken care of mm. by the author or the showrunner or the writer. It makes you feel good. It, it makes you feel it's good. It's like a little hug. Like I'm going to squeeze you in the beginning and squeeze you at the end yep. and just going to give you all this warm, lovely goodness in the middle. Yeah, and, and and it rewards you as a, a reader or, mm-hmm. uh, or a viewer. I mean, mm-hmm. if you've been paying attention and you, you engage with the material, it rewards you. Like, oh my God, I know what that is like yes. it, that that was at the beginning of the uh, of the film or the beginning of the book so so what was your gbg for the sorcerer's stone <sighs> aka <A-K-A-K. laughs> the philosopher's stone uh my good uh and this is a this is a big one for me it, it almost was my great uh and th- this is also another commandment of mary and blake media are you gonna sing uh no because okay. that, that that is a desk <laughs> i'm not supposed to sing that is a commandment uh, but I, I think one of the first commandments we ever made. Thought you were going to sing the Hogwarts theme. Oh God, no! Hogwarts, that might Hogwarts, be my bad huggy, now. Huggy Hogwarts. Yeah, I think that is my bad. <laughs> I think that is my bad. No, they. No. Yeah, I'm out on that. Are you kidding I'm me? I'm out on the Hoggy 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 Hogwarts the, song. The song that they get to sing however they want with whichever tune. Yep. Yep. I'm giving you a preemptive Hogwarts, bad. Hogwarts, Hoggy Hoggy Hogwarts, teach us something, please. But that's the the movie version that was deleted. But you could have sung it to however you'd like. No, God, please, no. Nope. No. That's right, Michael. I can't no. believe that I opened. That's right. I mean, no! we were just talking about my psychic abilities. I feel like I found this way too quickly. You did find that way too quickly. I literally found the song. She opened the book and there it was. <laughs> the freaking song, the stupid Hoggy Hog. That is the song. second time tonight that I did something really crazy. Oh, man, that was crazy. All right, so, uh, yeah, that's my preemptive bed. That's it. The, the Hoggy Hoggy Hogwarts song. I'm out on it. Okay, well, let's get to your real GBGs. Okay. Um, my good. And again, this is a Mary and Blake commandment. We already Show, know we've heard this. Don't tell me. Okay. Show me, don't tell me. The author's ability to show me her characters without having to tell me her characters are freak it's freaking awesome. It's incredible. Within within two pages or even a paragraph of a description, you get an amazing collection of of special uh attributes and characteristics of these characters that are unique to them. And the one that stands out in my brain the most is when we're introduced to Hermione and how she just Ugh. speaks so quickly and she's right on it. And, and and she's telling Ron that he's got dirt on his nose and, and she's spinning around and hair is everywhere and telling him they got to get their uh, robes on and all of it. it. It's just, it's amazing. So uh, I really love that. Uh, you already heard my preemptive bad, but my my real bad is I feel like when we get into the Nicholas Flamel and Norbert chapters, we're, okay. sp- we're spinning wheels. Spinning wheels, meaning? Uh, meaning, like... Because, I mean, they all get you. Is Lumos... <laughs> Lumos, Lumos is touching over the all computer? the buttons. Lumos is touching all the buttons. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> We were having succession play. I'm so sorry. <laughs> sorry, ladies and gents. Blake's brooding music. Yes, I was listening to it as I was getting ready for the show. Um, 
Because all of those things are important. You you need to understand Nicholas Flamel and what he created and why Voldemort wants that. And yeah, you yeah. need to understand. Because I was thinking that too. Like Norbert comes and goes, but Norbert is the reason that they get in such bad yeah, trouble. I, I, will, I will say this. Spinning wheels is probably not the right term. I would say it is clunky. The, those couple of chapters, they're clunky. And because of that... It's like, okay, what am I reading? And why am I reading all this? I know that there is important stuff. And I know, especially the Norbert chapter. Mm -hmm. I feel like Nicholas Flamel wouldn't have bothered me so much if it wasn't followed up by Norbert. Yeah. Um, But because it was, it's like I start lumping these two in and it just feels very episodic. It feels very clunky. And I feel like there are are different and more efficient ways at – getting you this information. And I think that that's why I gave it a 4.9 rather than a solid 5 because sure. I do agree with you it felt a little clunky or slash rushed but on the flip side this was the first one. <laughs> Melissa says on Facebook Lumos clearly likes the Hogwarts song. Blake. She, she heard it and came running. <laughs> oh man my Lumos our cat just loves to join us uh, when we're doing the podcast. And the great for me the great is the sleight of hand from the author. Uh, her showing you quarrel the entire time time, but forcing you to be in Harry's POV, forcing you to understand Quirrell through Harry's Mm -hmm. lens. Uh, And she just stuck with Harry the entire time. And she stuck with that. She's, she didn't lie to us at all. She didn't say, Ooh, look, uh, Snape is really bad. She, she just forced you to look at it through Harry's perspective. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to do that, of course, you're going to think that Snape is really bad. But she does this great thing where she never lies. She tells you right up front that Quirrell is the bad guy. You just don't perceive it that way. Or that he at least should be in the running for the bad guy. I don't think she like flat out says like he's the bad guy, but he's always there. Like if you were playing Clue, Mm -hmm. you'd be like, I can't cross Quirrell off yet on my card. Like I'm not 100% sure that he wasn't in the dining room with the candlestick. Yes. Yeah, because <laughs> he kind of was there every time. <laughs> as a matter of fact, I, I know I've brought this comparison up before, but I'm going to bring it up again because Christopher Nolan has a new movie, Tenet, coming out, and I cannot wait to see it. But the way that um, the author handles the Quirrell and Snape thing, mm-hmm. it reminds me a lot of the Prestige. Uh, if you remember in the Prestige, you know Hugh Jackman and Christian Bale are having this magic fight off thing, and they and then Christian Bale gets. It gets um, Hugh Jackman's journal and he's reading it and yes. his entire time he's thinking that he's got one up on Hugh Jackman and he's not wrong. I mean, he's not, he's not wrong, but he's not right yeah. either. And then in the journal, he says, got ya, you suck, bro. And this then the whole thing happens. Fake. And it's because you just weren't paying enough attention. Yeah. Um, and I was so impressed by that twist in the film it reminds me of this. Uh, Harry yeah. Potter reminds me of that. Very cool. Bit. So uh, so that is that. That is RGBGs. Uh, and uh, actually, Allie here on YouTube says, I'm sitting here at 2 a.m. in my Harry Potter pajamas listening to a podcast about a book that was written almost 25 years ago. That's how much of an impact this book created. Yes, Allie. Thank you for joining us. Allie's in Ireland. All right. Way to be. Nice. Nice job. All right. So, um... Marvin, where do you want to go from here? Um, what, what do you, how, how do you want to attack the book overall? Uh, I, I mean, I think a good way might be to start at the beginning, as it's a very good place to start. A very good place to start, but I mean, there's a bunch of different ways we can go. What do you think? Well, did we get any questions in the email? Well, or? we're gonna get to that. Oh, okay. Yeah, we're gonna get to that. You're the one that wrote the show notes, so I'm going to let you lead. Oh, okay, fine. Because I have specific talking points of <clears throat> things that I want to delve into theoretically wise. Okay. But I'll let you, since you have the Google Doc. All right, no problem. <laughs> Take the reins. Um, so I guess, I think one of the most brilliant things that the book does is it starts you off in just the regular human world. And it introduces you to Harry uh, as baby. And it gives you everything all at once. It gives you 
the 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 normal world, the Dursleys learning about the Dursleys and like they're awful people. There mu- there are things called Muggles. Uh, there's there are wizards. People that there are people who turn into cats and come back. And there's a thing called the Deluminator that takes light and and then not giving you after that chapter, not giving you anything else magical. No. It just says, okay, here's Harry Potter. And he's with the Dursleys. And it's terrible. And it's awful. Mm-hmm. Um, it, there, are, there is so much to love and mm-hmm. there is so much to uh, hate about the Dursleys. Uh, and there's so much that is, that is magical and there's so much to relate to that it, because it starts off in such a human way. It's, it, I think it's the right choice. Would you agree with this? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, you're connected because you're intrigued so much right away with this whole wizarding aspect. And then, boom, you're in the normalcy and the monotony of, you know, a basic human family's life. Except we know this boy is special. We know that there isn't a wizard in the world who's not going to know his name. And yet, not only is he living a normal muggle life, but he's actually not living a normal muggle life. He's living a terrible version of a muggle life. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And you're rooting for him already. And it, and it, it doesn't just spit you into this magical world. You have to sit with him for a while. And then not only that, it brings him to the magical world. Oh my gosh, that and, was so fun. And then it says, nope, gotta go back. Got time to go back. Got time to go back to the Dursleys. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, yes. it, 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 you don't, it's not just this happy little fairy tale of, hey, Hagrid comes and rescues me and everything's okay now. No, 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 no. You go back to the Dursleys and you have to deal with it. Then you go back to school. You mm-hmm. do all the things that you do. You, you become Harry freaking Potter. You do, you defeat the, the well kind of defeat the darkest wizard of all time i mean you pretty much kill a teacher yeah you do kill a teacher oh, no. essentially We're gonna talk about that and <laughs> and it's like that's kind of just you know eh, don't worry about that we're okay it's it's fine and then he has to go back home there's a reality to all of yeah. this and i really like that that the author never winks at you she never says See what I'm doing here? Yeah. This is silly. See it? No, no, no. She treats it with the, she treats it with care, mm-hmm. and she treats it in a manner that respects the the characters. It respects the story, um, and it respects the mythology that she creates. Uh, what I guess what what is your what's your favorite part of the mythology that this book gives us? Oh wow. In what way do you mean mythology? Well, like the world of it all. Like, uh, is it like Dumbledore fighting Grindelwald? Is it um, um, I, Quidditch? I like the all fact- the rules of Quidditch, like stuff like that. And I will pose this question to you, the listeners, as well. I like the fact that this magical world is in the real world. I think when you read things like Game of Thrones, that is the world, you know, or you read Lord of the Rings, like Middle Earth is the world, whereas. The Wizarding World takes place in conjunction with real London. Like, they Uh talk about the zoo that they go to, and they talk about King's Cross. Like, they talk about these real-life places, but in the midst of it all is this hidden world that is there near the Muggles, but they can't see it because it's bewitched so that they can't see it. Uh Um, And I just think that that is wild, and I think that that makes so much fun and mystery. I mean, we could think about parallel universes and things like that, but it just makes it the fact that there is something so extraordinary just below the surface of the ordinary, I think is what I love the most. Right. Uh, Rebecca Ann here on Facebook says, what's funny about that first chapter is that it didn't feel very human world because of the magical side of what is happening with Dumbledore and McGonagall and Hagrid and, and everything else. Mm -hmm. Um, that's interesting. It, I I I find that a, I, I find that purposeful the way that she that the way that the author wrote it, mm. um, because it is set in the the normal mundane world. Yes. Um, but there it, it juxtaposed against it, you know that 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 yes. that film negative on top of it is that all these people that are just kind of drawn into the world. Yep. Um, I find that. That difference, that palpable difference, the reason mm-hmm. why that chapter works so well. Would yes. you? Do you think that's fair? Oh yeah, oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, I think my favorite mythology part of it all, mm-hmm. um, 
my, my favorite mythology part of it all is that there is this, there was this brewing war. Like mm. there was this thing that happened that nobody wants to talk about. Nobody wants to acknowledge. Nobody wants to even say the guy's name. And he did such damage that it fractured the, the wizarding world. Mm hmm. And they come back from it, but they were never quite sure it was gone or it was done with or it was over. Yeah. And I find that remarkable because it, it, it sets up an automatic tension for you as a reader or as a viewer that it's, yes, yay, wizarding chess, yay, uh, wee, birdie bots, every flavored beans, you know, like, wee, Quidditch. But in the back, in the back of it all is there's this thing that happened with Voldemort. And it ain't resolved yet. No. You yeah. know, it, it's something almost to that, that dare I say bothered me about the last book in this series is I'm always left wondering, like, are we sure he's dead? Like, we thought he was dead last time. Yeah. And granted, we now got to kind of see it happen. But I feel like when you... I don't know. I just don't trust Voldemort. I think that he really stumped the wizarding world. Mm -hmm. You know, there's so much that they can't explain because they are so magical that they think a lot of the problems or the things, the questions that we may have as mere muggles is an easy explanation. And they have all of these spells. They even have their own wizarding jail. Like they can solve a lot of problems. And I think that that not only scared them with everything going on with the Death Eaters and Voldemort rising to power, but also the fact that he did just disappear. And yep. there was that slight mystery to it and time had gone by you know 11 years had gone by um and yet or was it 10 years 10 years had gone by yeah, 10 years. and it was it, because it had gone by people kind of forget i mean like voldemort comes back in this book right, and it's right. not a huge deal voldemort like harry and dumbledore see voldemort on curl's head they know what's going on Nicholas Flamel probably believes Dumbledore. You know, hopefully some of the staff believe Dumbledore, that that's who we're protecting it from. And yet you don't get this huge like, oh, it's in the Daily Prophet. And yeah. everyone knows like it takes multiple books for people to believe that this bad thing is back. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And I, the funny thing is, is that e even between Dumbledore and Harry, it's kind of like, yeah, he's gone, but I, I don't, I, he's going to yeah. try to come back. He's going to try to come back. And it, you're right, Mary. It's just this, like, it's kind of like, a, oh, NBD. You know, it, it's, it, I felt like it was a bigger deal that it was the total secret what happened in the, in the, and downstairs below everybody. So, of course, naturally, everybody knows about it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I thought that was a bigger deal than Voldemort coming back. But that's what I'm wondering. Like, he says, you know, everyone, uh, naturally, everyone knows what happened. Okay, if everyone, knows what happened, <laughs> why doesn't anyone take this seriously? Right, right. Because let's just, let's simmer on this for a moment. Quirrell died. Like a professor <laughs> who the students have known, especially, you know, like seven-year students, like they've probably known him for a long time. Yes, he went on a sabbatical for a little while to go, you know, supposedly research vampires and stuff. But he has now taught these students for at least a year, if not more. He's now dead, was there a funeral? Like, would they have a funeral for him? Does everyone know that he was working for the Dark Lord? And are they just kind of cool? Because they go from Harry killing a professor. Essentially. Essentially. Manslaughter, we can say. Okay. <laughs> Involuntary. And then it's just like, all right, time to eat. <laughs> Which, like, I'm down with. <laughs> but... Oh, man. Like, there's obviously this empty chair at the... At the faculty table. Right. You know, was there like a black sheet draped across it? <laughs> Are you just like, he went bad in the end, so we're not going to mourn him? Yeah. Like, how do, like, how do you even approach all if that? If it really is all the the talk in the school, what is all the talk in the school? The Voldemort part? The Quirrell part? Like, an 11-year-old went into a room with a grown man, and that grown man is now dead. <laughs> the whole school knows. And yet, it's not a big deal. Yeah, right. It's just they kind of whistle past the graveyard, yeah, literally on that Lit one. If if he was was he even buried? 
What happened to him? Like, does like, he do have a body? Home? Do they have? Does he have family? Does he just like burn because of Harry's touch? Uh, does he turn into ash? Or does Dumbledore just say, "Whatevs, I'm leaving you there"? Does he just? <laughs> Nobody else knows. Come here, Fluffy. <laughs> <laughs> do, do, do. <laughs> uh, Melissa here on Facebook says it's very difficult to pick one mythology out of the entire mm. uh, book, the, uh, at least one part of it. But she does love the wand Ooh, lore. Oh yes. And I will say, the first meeting with Ollivander mm. is a great meeting. Meeting, just because it sets up everything that's coming. When I got my wand assigned to me mm-hmm. on the the wizard app, what you know Pottermore used to be in now, I got so excited. And it's not like I got a physical wand, but to know what mine was made out of and that mine had dragon heart string. Like I'm the only one in our family who has a dragon heart string core of a mm. fictional completely on my phone wand, but still. I was really proud of it. Yep. Hillary brings up a great uh, question here on Facebook. She says, if the students knew the rumors about Harry and Voldemort, why were they so convinced he was lying in book four about Voldemort being back? I think because they were students. He's back. I feel like students can be very fickle. I mean, people in general can be very fickle and you can hear one thing and hear something else. And I mean, heck, we all see things on social media that are red, blue, everything in between. And, you know, people can can spur things different ways. Sure. What shocks me is the faculty. OK, we're not just talking about 11 year old. Oh, Voldemort's back. No, he's not. OK, he's not. This kid told me. <laughs> Dean Thomas told me he's not back. I'm fine. Thanks, guys. But like, what about Professor McGonagall? What about like Flitwick? What about all these really intelligent people who were there during the Voldemort time? Mm-hmm. Do they not know that that's what happened? Are they just? That's kind of what boggled me a little bit. Right. And their coworker, who they would sit with, at like, did they go out for for brews with with curl to the hogshead for a little bit? Like, you know, as a teacher, we would do that. We would go to like this dive bar on Fridays, and mm-hmm. they would have karaoke and stuff. Like, I just picture a couple of the faculty members doing that with Quirrell. and now it's like, oops. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I guess he uh, bit the dust. Yeah. <laughs> hey, but time to hit the dusty trail. <laughs> uh. Okay, let's move on from this because it's right. something that I don't know. All right, fair enough. Uh, so I, I kind of want to talk about Harry in general just because obviously the book is about Harry and his journey. Uh, Harry's beginning and Harry's ending. Um, something that I think is so important to any story that you're going to tell is a story of how that person changes how that person evolves what is the point of what we're reading or what we're watching so i would love your opinion on how you think harry begins and then how he ends what is your major takeaway from harry potter and the sorcerer's stone as relates to harry's arc that harry belongs somewhere Mm -hmm. i think for so much of harry's life he doesn't feel like he belongs and he feels um i mean harry's a still quite sure of himself. I don't want to say that Harry feels unworthy because I don't think Harry ever feels that way, but I don't think Harry ever feels seen. Oh, I like that. And then he is seen in a way that he doesn't feel like he quite earned, but then by the end he's earned it. And yes. And he slowly earns it throughout the year. And he's proud of who he is. Yes. Yes. He's proud of who he is. Uh, I think you are definitely on the right track, Mary. Um, and again, I'll pose this to the listeners uh, who are who are watching right now and for everybody on the podcast app. I think I kind of want to piggyback on that, okay. uh, Mary. Where oink, oink. Uh, <laughs> That'll do, pig. <laughs> that'll do. Um, I, I, I kind of want to jump on that back, if you will, uh, by saying Harry discovers his family. Uh, in a way that I think he interprets what family should be. I feel like we need Darren Chris singing Not Alone. Oh, we will absolutely <laughs> do that for the end of there you go. The, the episode. Thank you very much. You're I welcome, will, because that pretty much sums it up. <laughs> uh, so vamp for me for a little bit as I, as I bring that up right now so I don't forget. I mean, someone here, uh, Tamara on YouTube says, in this book, he went from no family to a school family to no 
um, and to know his his parents. So, you know, from having no knowledge of his parents to getting all this great knowledge in these photographs, but also feeling like he belongs somewhere. He has people who genuinely care about him, who shower him with love, who care about, you know, protecting him, who give him lots of gifts, who remember special things about him, like the fact that he loves chocolate frogs. Um, it's just really special. Right. And, and he discovers that one of the things that stands out to me, too, from the book is that Harry begins cowering from Dudley and he is quiet and at the end of the book the final line is I'm going to have a lot of fun with Dudley this summer yeah think of that transition the shoulders moving back like, yeah, like here I am and I'm going to F with this kid Shh, please. I didn't say it I, I said I know, a different I word I don't like even that okay uh, and, I, and I'm going to mess with this kid I want you to pretend our way. kids listen to this okay and I'm going to mess with this will. kid in the best way okay and that bravery that encompasses Everything that I, in, in a that Harry achieved throughout the whole book, it begins with him cowering and ends with him saying, "I'm going to mess with him." It it stands th- uh, that magic is now part of his life. Mm-hmm. That he's discovered a certain kind of bravery. He's discovered a certain kind of belonging. That he's just returning to the Dursleys. That his real home is at Hogwarts. He doesn't feel bound to the Dursleys anymore. Uh, all of these things are discovered throughout the entire book. That yeah. arc is so important. Would you agree or disagree that the other three characters, or, or the the big three, let's call them the big three, um, or the, the remainder of the big three, uh, Hermione and Ron, <laughs> Okay. <laughs> the other two. I mean, Neville's kind of a big deal, too. Yeah. Uh, Poor yes, Neville. Yes. Neville, I... Neville does have a good arc because he begins looking for Trevor, holding on to Trevor with dear life. An amazing arc. And then at the end just says, I'm going to stand up and let's Trevor go. I know that doesn't sound like a whole ton, but again, you have to look at it from the way that a character begins to how the character ends. That is the last time we essentially see uh, uh, um, um, Neville, except for the very final paragraph of the book or whatever it is, when he's just he when he has Trevor and there he is. When he stands up to Malfoy, like right, all right. these different things. I just loved Neville's arc. It was really beautiful to read again, especially because you you watch the movie so many times and you don't really get to enjoy Neville's personal arc that even just happens within this one book. And remembering, of course, that Neville could have been the chosen one. Yep. Neville was so close to being the boy that Voldemort essentially picked. And um, I think that's really wild. Um, so would you agree that Ron and Hermione have similar effective arcs throughout this book um, do you, as, as Harry? And even let's just say Neville, too. I think that they have different arcs. I think they have very different arcs. Were they as a, uh, Different is good. I, I like different. Is it as effective for you? As yeah. the other two, as I think, Harry's. You know, as friends, they balance each other out beautifully. Her- Hermione came in as this nosy know it all, and she left taking chances, standing up for her friends. She, you know, didn't have to be in the one in the spotlight all of the time. And, you know, she she knows that friendship and bravery is really important. So mm-hmm. I, I love that. And then Ron, Ron has a beautiful arc in especially in the books i feel like ron is really gypped in the movies uh for his bravery and for stepping into his own greatness you know ron of course we've talked about it before is is a son in this long line of sons in the weasley family and also seem feels unimportant mm-hmm. and for him to have best friends i think is such an important thing for him right and and but also wanting to stand out but letting go of trying to stand Mm -hmm. out for the sake of his friends yes and for the sake of the good right for the sake of what's good and hermione the same she was so rigid at the beginning of the book so so stuck in rules and 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 get your robes on and 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 being a total whirlwind yeah that at the end of the book she hugs harry in a slow moment and says you're a great great wizard and so cute throughout the whole book is breaking rules, breaking more rules. Mm-hmm. And, but it then realizes I need to do this in order for the betterment of yes. all of us. Uh, another good, um, exceptional arc, I feel like. And speaking of that, of the end, when, when she says you're a great wizard, mm-hmm. 
of course that we're, we're sitting, we've sat with the end. Now we read it a few days ago. We talked about it pretty extensively uh, in the last episode. So if you want to hear our thoughts on that, go back to the last episode. Uh, but sitting with that ending, are you, are you a fan of the ending? How abruptly it ends, how efficient the author was with that ending. Um, I think that this is where I said in the beginning of this episode that you can tell that this is the first book of this series. As you mm-hmm. read the other series, you feel a bit more satiated when you get to this point of the book. Sure. Um, you feel like there aren't as many questions unanswered that do seem a bit forced, do seem a bit quick. I mean, the last chapter is Harry first seeing Quirrell to him coming home to Vernon Dursley. And Mm -hmm. it's just a a matter of pages that the entire thing, you know, kind of lands upon. So um, I wouldn't say I'm necessarily a big fan of how quickly it goes, but on the flip side, when you have the ability to read now the series and not wait to get the next book, it is kind of lovely because you automatically go from this page to picking up book two. Sure. Um, And I am of the opinion where at first I was disappointed. And then I, as we talked about, I thought about it through the lens of the hunger games Mm. and how I evolved on that ending. And I kind of evolved with this ending as well. It's not just Harry. It's not Harry, you know, in the final boss, big, bad fight. You know, this isn't, you know, little, the little guy in, in Tyson's punch out, finally fighting Mike Tyson in Nintendo. This is, you know, a, a kid who's way in over his head is just flying by the seat of his pants and by sheer luck. I mean, he's flying by his Nimbus 2000. <laughs> just out of luck. Sheer dumb luck. Does he as realize? As McGonagall would say. Right. I'm going to keep going. He, he somehow hurts Quirrell, mm-hmm. who otherwise probably would have smoked Harry if he didn't do his whole Bond villain, you know, <laughs> monologue thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> It, it should have just, he should have just died. That should have been it. But Because Krull could have probably Avada Kedavra'd him. Absolutely. Like, I'm trying to figure out the blood protection, the protection of Lily Potter on Harry Potter, mm-hmm. if that was like a one-time deal. Like, can Voldemort never kill Harry Potter because of her protection? Could Krull have killed Harry Potter because it was protection from Voldemort? Huh, that's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. That's a good question. We'll have to give that more thought. Like, is it a one-time shot? Um, hmm. Interesting. I mean, did Lily throw away her shot? <laughs> no, she didn't. <laughs> um, yeah, that's interesting. I like that. I mean, but clearly, though, well, because at the end of the book, Voldemort does do the Avada Kedavra, and it doesn't work, uh, at, at the end of the series, rather. So, like... Is it a one-shot deal? I, I, I don't think so. Or does Harry just step into his own greatness and he is able to do it? <laughs> or was, exactly. Was it a lifetime? Is it a lifetime charm? Is it a lifetime subscription? Like like when you buy an app <laughs> on your phone, is it a monthly charge or is it like just a one-time thing? Is it and like you're Publishers like, yeah, Clearing? Sure. Well, not Publishers Clearinghouse. Remember when you used to get the CDs in the mail? No. And they would send it to you? No. And it, like you had a subscription? I, my mom didn't let me do that. <laughs> My mom did it. Of course she did. <laughs> she, did she did all that stupid stuff. <laughs> okay, uh, we got some listener questions. Uh, well, actually, oh. Melissa says, the protection from Lily only continues to work in the Dursley's house, I thought. That's why he has to go back there each summer. And I didn't know, Melissa, if it only happened while he was in the house or if he had to be back at the house once a year and that protected him. If, mm. As long as he was there once a year. Yeah, uh, Tamara says, remember, Harry had to keep with his aunt and uncle to keep it working. But that's why I'm wondering, like, if he was at Hogwarts, was the protective spell with him still because he spent time within that year with his blood, with his family? Or was it only while he was at his aunt and uncle's house, but then while he was at Hogwarts, he was safe, quote unquote, because he was at Hogwarts, which, let's be real, is the most unsafe place that I've ever heard of. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So, yeah, I think either way, Regardless of the the logic behind the charm that Lily casts, okay? I know, because I just got like really... That was like some serious... Sorry. Like that was... I'm getting nerd sweats thinking about it. Uh, But 
regardless of all that, the theme of it all, I think, goes in a straight line throughout the book. And mm-hmm. the author does an exceptional job carrying out that theme. What is uh, what? What does love mean to a family? What does love mean to in, in friendship? And how does love protect us? Mm-hmm. Uh, and what does it mean to be brave? Uh, and how, does does bravery um, supplement love? You know, all, all, I think those questions are are very specifically asked in this in this book, and that's why I think the ending is, even though it is very efficient, um, I think the ending is good because it requires love and friendship to defeat Quirrell and Voldemort. Harry just doesn't do it by himself. Um, he, he does it with the help of Ron and Hermione, but really specifically through Dumbledore and that parental figure that Dumbledore is. Uh, and that he's a, a, a substitute father taking care of this of this. Kid. I wouldn't call him a parental figure. Oh, I kind of do. I would, I would see him as a teacher. Yeah. <sighs> I yes, see Hagrid but, but parents stepping are in teachers. As, I see Hagrid more as the parent. I don't know. Like teaching you things of life. By the way, you're a wizard. I'm going to tell you a little secret because, you know, we're close and I've got a dragon. I'm going to tell you stories about myself and I'm going to buy you a birthday cake and a birthday present. Mm, like I would not do what Dumbledore did to my kid. And Hagrid regrets that he possibly could have been the reason that Harry. So I don't see Dumbledore as a parental person. I see Dumbledore as a teacher and as a person who has a plan. All right. Fair enough. All right. So now let's get into the <laughs> listener questions, listener emails. My Dumbledore dilemma. So, uh, yeah, let's do it. Oh, Miles head. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, uh, for those of you who are listening in the podcast app, if you have questions for us, please just send them to us at maryandblakemedia at gmail.com. You can do that now. You can do that for the next episode. It's always available. Just go to maryandblake.com and just hit the contact, do the email button. It's right there. Woo! Uh, And for those of you who are watching us live, if you have questions now, put them in. Now is the time, nerds. Get it in so that way we can talk about them. The first one I want to start off with is uh, Angela on Facebook. She says... You said when that Harry caught the snitch in his mouth, it was going to have some importance. Is that connected to the stone? This comes up in book seven, Angela. And so there is, hold on tight, Spider Monkey. There is connection to a stone, but that's all I'm going to say. Because, dot, I, dot, dot. because I know that Angela has not read the books and she has not watched the films. So there is significance there. So it does not go unnoticed. Okay. Uh, let's see here. The first one comes from Heather. She says, Snape fades into the background at the end of the book, despite having a fairly prominent and suspicious role in the earlier parts. Do you have any issues with that, Mary and Blake? Do you feel that the author handled this well? Mary, do you feel like the author handled the Snape of it all well at the end of the book? And Heather is proud to say that she loves the podcast and she is now a proud nerd clan member Thanks, as well. Heather. Thank you, Heather, an official member of the nerd clan. So in my mind, Curl took care of Snape on that ill-fated night as well. Just like how we're thinking that Curl possibly wrote a letter for Dumbledore to go to London to get him out. I feel like maybe he pulled a prank and did something on Snape because Snape was given a task of protecting Harry, which he'd done a really good job with the entire year and keeping his eye on Quirrell, which he'd done a really good job with the entire year. And yet somehow this night, both Quirrell and Harry are able to get inside and... um you know, have this whole situation go down. So do I think that it was handled well? Um, Not necessarily, but on the flip side, I think we had to keep that ambiguity there because we need to think that it could be Snape in there. So I, do we see Snape even at the dinner? Like is Snape ever mentioned at all aside from when they bring him up? Like is Snape there having a, you know, let's just pretend that Snape was like, I did my job. I'm going to have a beer. I don't see him doing that. No, uh, I see him going on like a really cool expedition vacation. No. Like a cruise to Greenland or something. <laughs> no way. He wants to go see the Northern Lights. He's got to be, go be around people but with, to do a cruise. He doesn't want to do that. Fine, he wants he'll to just be go alone. by himself. Do you think he just goes on a walk? Like, do you think he takes a broom and flies to like... He'll apparate... You know, some are very quiet without students. Like, I think the day that exams were done, he submitted his reports and he was like, peace. Yeah, I'm out. 
Yeah. And, and he just goes to he like... He did not go to the end of term feast. He just, do you think he just goes to the Grand Canyon and just sits? Or is he totally Snape? And does he go to his house and he just looks at a picture of Lily smiling? Does he go to the grave of Lily sobbing? That is emo. That is Snape emo. There we go. He just like, instead of seeing all the kids, he's like, I did my job. What I did my job. World <laughs> eats now. Suddenly. <laughs> love, sweet love. <laughs> Sour McLaughlin's playing over. <laughs> uh, he just, you know, he holds, he holds the uh, thing there. Yeah. Oh, hold on. Rebecca's saying that Snape was in the hospital room when they were all around Harry. Maybe. Yeah, but either way, it's... He, I'm still making it up in the my fact head is, that he the, was on vacation. The fact is, <laughs> even if he was there, it's not memorable enough for us to even remember it. And it is somewhat of um, a letdown for that particular character. It's like Quarrel did all the heavy lifting for Snape. And that was it. That was the end of it. <laughs> Snape is Enya. Yes. <laughs> Who can uh, say? Uh, Victoria says Snape doesn't drink beer, and he's definitely not a cruiser at no, all. No, no, you're right. Sorry, no, I'm I'm out on Snape going on cruises. <laughs> um, no, he's totally a Sarah McLaughlin fan. I didn't think he was in the hospital wing. Someone correct. <laughs> let me know. Let me know. Okay, next uh, uh, next email. Yeah, the next one comes from Hillary. She says. This is more of an observation, mm. but bless those Hogwarts professors who apparently are the only professor in their given subject. Seriously? I never really gave it much thought before, but imagine s- teaching students from four houses yep. and seven different grade levels yep. the lesson plans they would have to do. How stressful. I can't bear to think about it. They must all have time turners. Because exactly, think about it. Generally, when you have a class, you're supposed to also have a prep sometime during that week for that class. So if you have seven grades... That you're teaching, um, but it's now it's not always the houses are often together. Mm-hmm. So basically, you have maybe 14 classes, but as you get into the older years, less kids take those classes, so mm-hmm. it might get lower. You know, so yeah, your first year level class, first year class, everyone's going to be taking you know basic transfiguration or you know the basics of, of magical history. Sure. But then as you go up and you start to figure out how you did on your old WLS. Or your newts. I don't know. Like, you got to pass into different things. But I agree that is a lot of teaching. Lots of butterbeer. If Snape suspected Professor Quirrell, why wasn't he guarding the door to Fluffy, knowing that Professor Dumbledore was away? Yeah. What do you think about that, Mary? I, I'm i making up my fanfic that he handed in his last report card and <laughs> left. I did my job. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's hanging out with Lily at the what grave. What the world needs now. <laughs> All right. Uh, of the many themes throughout the book, which best encapsulates uh, the Sorcerer's Stone for you, Mary? Ooh. Love. Love. Sweet love, <laughs> but truly love. Oh, man. Basically, my answer to number two as well. Kate says, you've clearly never taught high school, Blake. Mm-hmm. Nope, never have, mm-hmm. never will, never wanted to. Thank you very much. Blake was going to be a teacher, That's and then he true. went on his visit to the classroom and saw the amount of work that it took to be a high school teacher, and he said, never no, mind. No, it wasn't, it wasn't the amount of work that pissed me off. It was, uh, sorry, that angered me. Thank you. It was the... Um, the fact that the kids that were there did not care. And, and I, I, so I got my degree in history and I was going to be, I wanted to be a history professor and I wanted to, to show the world how great history is and the whole thing and how we can learn from our mistakes and yada yada. So I try at, at Manchester Central, I went to one sit in. Yep. I saw the kids. Bored. I basically did the Homer Simpson. I walked in, put my, uh, the, sorry, the Grandpa Simpson. I walked in, put my hat on the rack, saw what happened, turned back around, grabbed my hat, put it back on, walked out the door all in one take. I was out on that. Nope, no thanks. All set. Uh, okay, let's see. Um, hmm. Oh, this Tim. one comes from Tim. Yes, Tim Tim's- Amara. Tim says, what house do you think each of the four hobbits Ooh. from Lord of the Rings, maybe even five if you include Bilbo, would have been placed in? Great question. All right. So let's break it on down. Uh, okay. So let's see. All right. Uh, Bilbo would be a Slytherin. Ooh. Bilbo is a Slytherin. 
I like older Bilbo, younger Bilbo. I, I, both. All the Bilbo. All Bilbo. He's mm-hmm. If you're a fan of The Lord of the Rings, you know what we're talking about. Um, Even The Hobbit? Because you never read The Hobbit. No, I read The Hobbit. You did? Yeah. When? I, I read it on the plane. I read the whole book in one plane oh, okay. ride, if you okay. remember. Um, I was not a big fan of The Hobbit, the book. I was not. I didn't Don't like even it. talk to me. And I, don't, and, and I don't even like the films. All don't three of those, even talk to me. Th- those films are... Are, the films, are okay. legitimately you're, bad. You're talking about the Hobbit films, not the Lord of the Ring films. Yeah, no, Lord of the Ring films are very good. Okay. Um, all right, so Bilbo, in my opinion, will be uh, Slytherin. Uh, Sam Wise, of course, is Hufflepuff. We know that. I think he's Gryffindor. Oh. I think he's actually Gryffindor. <sighs> Sam is so brave. Yeah, and he, he... Does abandon, he does abandon Frodo for a little bit. I think Sam is totally. He might be Gryffindor. You might be right. I think Sam is like a Ron Weasley, but yes. like better than Ron Weasley. Like yeah. if Ron and I don't even know, just a sweet little put in. Yep. I mean, Sam is just so great. Sam's my favorite character from <laughs> the Hobbit <laughs> series. Okay, so Frodo. Frodo. Oh, bless his sweet little heart. Frodo's a Hufflepuff. He's a definitely a Hufflepuff. He's like, can I please just be home? And like, I know that that's what Sam says he wants to. But, and Frodo is brave for quite some, maybe Frodo's a Gryffindor too. Oh. Maybe they're Gryffindors together. They, <sighs> Pippin. Let's go with Pippin. Pippin's a Hufflepuff. <laughs> so is Mary. Mary's a Hufflepuff too. Because <laughs> yeah, they, they just are. hang out with each other. They are. And they're just like, they're, pu- just they're so happy Mary. puffs. They're so happy puffs. Wait, so nobody's a Slytherin, you think? No, Bilbo's a Slytherin. Bilbo, okay. Yeah. And I don't nobody's see any Ravenclaws. Nobody's a Ravenclaw, Claws. I would agree. Um, if I had Gandalf would be a Ravenclaw. Gandalf would be. Like I'd want to give Frodo some Ravenclawness, like in his latter years, mm. where he's just like wizened. I don't know. And he, you know, f- finishes everything and goes off to the Elvish world. Okay, all that right. was a great question. Thank you, Tim. All right, Anna says now that the movies all are all out and the books are done, you've probably watched them many times. Do either of you have a preference to liking the book best? Or the movie version, which would you choose? Obviously, movies could have more, but especially now that we're just finished a read of this particular book. Mary, if you had to choose the books or the films, what would you choose? I mean, I'm always going to choose the books, to be honest, because they just go into so much more detail. And I love using my imagination and I love the words that are chosen. I do adore the movies. I think that this would be a great question that we should pose after each movie rewatch. Do we like the movie better or do we like the book better? Does that feel good? So like if this book for me was a 4.9, yes, will the movie be a 4.9 or a 5? <sighs> you see, but the problem... Hmm. Ooh, Allie in Ireland, who's still with us going strong, says Sam is the Neville of Lord of the Rings. Yes. Yes, Allie. <laughs> um, hmm, that's a good question. If I had to choose one, I would choose the films. Because I feel like the films... I mean, let's let's refresh everybody's mind. You haven't read all the books yet, I haven't read all so... the books. But re- even knowing the books that I read, which yeah. are the best books, obviously... But you're a movie person. But I'm a movie person. So I appreciate the the art of it, the yes. art of the films, especially Order of the Phoenix. Oh, Blake is all into like, do you see the coloring? Do you see the light? Oh, Did you God. see the symmetry in this shot? Did you see this lower, whatever? And I'm David like, Yates' no. first film in that series is is incredible. It's incredible. And I really appreciate the seventh film and the, the eighth film as well. So uh, this one, uh, and it asks, uh, so they start Hogwarts when they are 11 or 10 or 11, right? But then does that mean they go to a normal school before or do they just hang out at home? I think if they're wizard born, if their parents are wizards, they probably are homeschooled uh, while they're younger. And because I didn't know any mother characters who had jobs in the wizarding world. So I feel like they are homeschooling the children so that they can teach them like basic magic stuff. And I think muggle born children do go to regular elementary school. I would like to hope that they could go to regular elementary school. um, But as a wizard who knows of the wizarding world, you're expecting a lot from those kids to 
not <laughs> break the secrets. Uh, people are hating on me saying, I did not, Kate says, Blake, stop it. Know what you were talking about. Rebecca says, did Blake literally just say that the movies are better? No, I didn't say that they were better. I said, I prefer films than books. I like the artistry of film, of filmmaking and what it takes. Yes, it is incredibly hard to write these books. And, it, and I have given the author so much credit for what she has done, but what it takes to put a film together and how to tell a, 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 a clear narrative within two, two and a half hours, uh, that is special. So no, I don't think that the movies are better per se. I just prefer film. So that is that. And yes, the, the books offer, uh, you know, a whole litany of things that the films don't. But Melissa Carolyn says, Wizardborn kids definitely don't go to a muggle elementary school. They don't know what electronics are and things. So true. Like they'd look at a pencil sharpener and be like, what's Wait, what? this? What? what? What is the purpose of a rubber duck? <laughs> uh, so... So that's that. Um, all right. Uh, if there are any other... Qu- oh, uh, sorry. We got one more. Uh, this one comes from Rachel. She Who's says joining she, us now. Uh, hi, Rachel. Thank you so much. She loves the podcast. It's so much fun to dive into the world with us. Uh, always feeling that she's chatting with us. And uh, she's her husband always asks who she's talking to. <laughs> Uh, when she's just listening and she sa- and he goes, oh, you're talking to your podcast friends. That's what Blake <laughs> would say to me a decade ago. That's true. Yeah. Uh, the good for her was the Sorting Hat song, the Centaurs, the Quidditch, the Hogwarts foods, the visit yes. to Hogsmeade with Hagrid and yes. all the Ron Sass and Harry yes. Sass. The bad is the Dursleys. Yep. I find myself thinking about how cruel they were to Harry and it makes me really upset that Dumbledore never sent a howler to them about their poor treatment of the little boy. Preach. Granted, he sent one in book five, but it was in regards to him kicking him out. Harry grew up never getting a proper gift or even a decent meal or even hearing a kind word. It's so sad. I feel like the level of neglect and his mistreatment and was taken too far. And the great is the way that the author describes everything. It's like slowly turning the pages of an elaborate pop-up book. You can picture each thing little by little, and then you can see the whole world before you. You feel totally immersed in the wizarding, and that's why so many of us say it is real for us. So, that's that. Love it. Hoping you are well. <laughs> you have to say it in that nice oh, yeah. little Hoping voice. Hoping you are well. Sincerely, Mafalda Hopkirk. Just kidding. It's Rachel D- Dido, a Hufflepuff who hilariously thought for at least six years that she was a Slytherin, but is totally yes. not a Slytherin. No. No. Uh, Allie asks, do you remember reading the book for the first time? I read the, bo- the first book and knew I was hooked. It was the summer holidays, and I went down to the bookstore every second day f- for the week. Marvin, I'm going to leave this one to you. Yeah, this is Blake's first time reading the book. So do you remember it, Blake? What? Reading the book this past two months. Yeah, I remember reading the book this past two months, yes. <laughs> but, um, yes, I remember vividly reading the first book. Um, my high school boyfriend's mom had recommended it to me. I was going through a very difficult time in my family. My parents were separating, and because of that, there was a lot of arguing in the household. Um, and I just didn't feel like I belonged. I feel like I wasn't being seen. Um, I also stood out a lot for my family because my family growing up was very, very religious, and I was questioning faith at that time and having a difficult time being heard when I just wanted to honestly have conversations about religion and people of the world. So it was a very hard time for me within the walls of my house. And um, my boyfriend at the time hadn't read the book, but I was talking with his mom and she was like, you need to read this book. And at that summer, I was working at a local water park and my job was to sit at the top of the toppest slide at the water park (laughs) and to let the little kids know like, okay, you can go. Wait. Okay, Johnny's down by the curve. Okay, you can go. (laughs) And on rainy days or cloudy days or just cold, chilly days when the water park wasn't that busy, that's when I read um, a lot of Harry Potter. (laughs) (laughs) So it got you through some... some some yeah, tough stuff. Yeah. As I feel like Harry does for a lot of people. Yep, I agree. Uh, Caitlin asks, I read an article once that said the reason the Dursleys were so horrible to Harry was because he was a horcrux. What are your thoughts about that? That would explain everything. Everything. Yes. Uh, <laughs> that would explain some stuff. That yeah. would. Uh, that'd be interesting if that were the case. Uh, all right. So if you have any final questions, ladies and gents, we are running way long on this. We're already in hour eight. 
normally we like to keep these bad boys at around 45 minutes to an hour. We were supposed to do episodes for only a half hour, but that kind of went out the window. That didn't work. That, kind of, that went way out the window, I think. <laughs> yeah, the first episode. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, so if there are any other uh, questions that you guys have that are watching the live, please send them now or forever. Hold your peace about the Sorcerer's Stone. Just kidding. You can probably talk to us about the Sorcerer's Stone at any time. Then we could never talk about it. So Truly. Uh, that would be that. Uh, Victoria actually asks, how could the Dursleys know that Harry was a Horcrux? Not that they would know, right. but just remember how the Horcrux made everybody who held it, you know, when it was in the locket, how it made everyone crabby and mean and snippy with each other. Um, so to that point, uh, the only thing that I would say that it didn't, it wouldn't have influenced it is that nobody else acted that way around Harry. So the Dursleys acted that way around Harry. But once Harry went to school, he made friends with a lot of people and a lot of people were nice to him. So if his Horcrux abilities made people treat him badly, then mm-hmm. why did Ron and Hermione treat him nicely? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. But uh, it's a great There's a question point. earlier in, in, in these comments here, I, and I don't remember who wrote it, so please take credit when I say it. Uh, there's a great question about uh, Norbert, the uh, the dragon. Yes. And why do you think the author made such a big deal about Norbert without ever reintroducing Norbert in later uh, in later books or films or whatever? Like Norbert never comes back. It's just he's he's there and then he's gone and that's the end. Do you feel like that's a cheat? Do you feel like that? And like that kind of we do hear about Norbert. Oh, forgive me. You haven't read that book. Yeah, but no, regardless, whatever, <laughs> you, you hear about him, but it, 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 he never makes... He's a, doing well. He okay? never, but he never makes a significant part of the plot. I, I would not want Norbert to be in any of the significant dragon plots that are in this this series. All of the dragons that are used in the plots going forward are tortured. Right, but that doesn't mean, that doesn't give an ex- the author the excuse to not involve Norbert in another way somehow. To Charlie help. tells Hagrid Norbert's doing really well. Yeah, he's mean really anything. happy in his new colony. Yeah. I think that's great. I think... That doesn't mean anything to me. I think it's wonderful. I, I totally disagree. I would hate to have been like, oh, Norbert, I'm gonna try to kill you, or like... No, like, Norbert you, comes or... and saves the day somehow, or like, maybe dragons have long memories and, they, and Norbert remembers Harry, or like... There's Can you a, write some fanfic about Norbert? <laughs> <laughs> yes, he turns into Toothless. There you go. <laughs> Done. Uh, okay, uh, let's see. Got, do we have any other questions? Mara, Mara wrote in okay, about her first attempt at reading the book was summer of 1998. Her mom got her the book in Spanish to Whoa. read while she studied abroad. I remember trying to read it and not understanding it at all. By the time Mara came back to 19, in 1999, it had blown up in the U.S., but she didn't read it in English until her 30s. Um, thanks to her love, gifting them to oh, her. Yay! yay! Snaps for you guys. Uh, okay, uh, I think that's it. I think that's all we got right now for all the questions. So that is that. Mary, are you ready to close this bad boy out? Do you have anything else that you'd like to say as a parting gift to the listeners about the Sorcerer's Stone? Any final thoughts about the Sorcerer's Stone before we move on to the film? We don't know how we're doing that episode yet. No, we don't. The movie episode. So stay tuned. Make sure that you are on our complimentary texting remind service. You text, if you're in the U.S., you text the phone number 81010, so 81010, and then in the message field, at sign Elder Wand. So the at sign E-L-D-E-R-W-A-N-D. If you're international, or if all of that that I just said sounds like, you know... I'm s- the word Hufflepuff. Um, that, it's a beautiful word, but it is a really funny word, right? Hufflepuff. It's, yeah, it's a funny um, word. If, if you'd rather go to a website, you can go to join oh, remind.com. So remind.com slash join slash Elder Wand, and you will get signed up for our complimentary texting service. But lasting impression upon this book, I'm just really excited. This feels like it flew by, and I'm pumped to get into Chamber of Secrets. Actually, that is the next question that we got by a bunch of people. When do we need to read the first chapter of the Chamber of Secrets, and when are we starting the next book for the podcast? Um, a week from today. A week from today, ladies and gents. So we will be doing the movie on Monday. Like, we'll be doing the episode for the movie on Monday. Yes. And... I don't think it's going to be a live watch. I 
I don't know. We're going to have to see. We'll be real with you guys. I, I would kids like been, to try to do it if we can. Our kids have been a little tough. They've been bananas. So part of me loves having this ability of being able to podcast and talk about things kind of scene by scene, having us already watched it. Yep. So we'll get back to you on that. But if you're on our texting reminder uh, service, then you And we'll get... put it up on social media if we're going to be doing it live or whatever. Yeah. So just make sure you follow us, Mary and Blake, uh, on all of the social media, whether it is Instagram, Twitter, uh, Facebook, all of it, you know, not TikTok because I refuse to take part in TikTok. So read chapter one of the Chamber of Secrets by next Wednesday. By next Wednesday. Okay. So that is that. Marvin, are you ready to close this bad boy out? I sure am. We're going to do it to the fine sounds of one Darren Chris. <laughs> Not allowed to sing. Not allowed to sing, Blake. You know what's funny about this song, though, is um, Blake had, of course, like never, never been really introduced to the Harry Potter series before knowing me, and then never watched a Harry Potter musical. That's right. Until we like sat down, I was like, "You have to appreciate this. You need to see this completely nerdy, amazing thing that combines so many of my favorite things in one." <laughs> And just recently, uh, myself and one of our listeners, Melissa, uh, got to go to New York City, um, and we got to see actually Darren perform. Hold on, here, here's a good part. You're here with me, and nothing's ever gonna break us down, cause nothing can. It's just like a magical, wonderful time. So since then, Blake has been listening to a few, a few songs. <laughs> but this one was rewritten in a different way, but it's still lovely. Anyway, um, that all being said, I'm just doing a lot of stuff right now. My homework is to watch that because I've never seen that musical. It's oh, on Rachel. YouTube, Rachel. It's on YouTube. Oh, just oh go watch gosh. it. It's great. Yes, it it, is it's like so poorly good. filmed and it sounds terrible, but it's awesome. Yeah, Melissa got to sit next to him and chat with him. It was such an amazing experience. Thank you, Melissa, once again. Uh, Rachel, let us know what your thoughts on the Very Potter musical. Friends, that's another thing you can watch this weekend. If you've just recently rewatched Harry Potter 1 and you're like, I need something different, check it out. And very the, Potter musical. And this song was in a Very Potter musical. Yes. Right? So, you know, it just, Not that's why. Not this version, but the no, song, yeah, yes. But the song was in it, and that's why it's appropriate that we're playing it. Yes. Just another Darren Chris song. Melissa suggested that we end every Potter First episode with a Darren Chris song. Ooh. I'm not against it. <laughs> not against it. <laughs> All right, my friends. Well, thank you so much, as always, for tuning in. We're sad to say goodbye to the Philosopher's Stone, but excited to open up the Chamber of Secrets. We will see who those of us may have parcel tongue. Ooh, Ooh, Ooh. parcel tongue. <laughs> Got myself a wicked good parcel tongue And remember, guy. the next episode of the Potterverse is going to be dissecting the movie Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Can't wait to talk about that. That one will not, definitely not even be close to a half hour long. We'll yeah, tell you that. That's it's going to be a bit it's on the longer, be a longer side. Longer um, for now. Hold on, wait. I, I oh. just got to say, we did get a winner for the review giveaway. Yes. Uh, we talked about this on the live before we started hitting record. But I'm feeling generous today. I'm feeling generous today. We're going to have another giveaway. So the next person between numbers 61 and 70 will get a free choice of their any product from the Mary and Blake store. And I've got to say, those of you who have not visited the Mary and Blake store, so you go to maryandblake.com, you click on the Mary and Blake store, right? Like shop or something. Yep. And I'm going to tell you guys something. I like to have my logos on my shirts really, really big. Like, I want people from Mars to be able to see what's on my shirt. From Mars, And kid. I was about to order the new design that Blake made with Dumbledore, wearing his headphones, hanging out with Fox, listening to It Doesn't Kill You, Makes You Stronger. And I was like, Blake, I want this logo bigger. And other people may want this logo bigger. I want you all to know, if you have been to the Mary and Blake store and you've looked at the designs and you wanted them bigger, you actually can. You can edit them. So... If you have questions, send us an email, maryandblakemedia at gmail.com. We want to make sure you love your shirts. And for now, my name is Mary. My name's Blake. Mischief managed. <laughs>